J. Elias, General Legal Counsel at Dyer Lake Funeral Home in North Attleboro. Welcome to this episode of Live and Learn, a series of programs designed to be informative, educational, and upbeat, and always intended to enhance and encourage our personal wellness and awareness. So here's the framework for this program. Let's consider whether some things we've come to know along the way are actually bad for us. That is, not so bad, bad, or really bad. Picture this. You're having some friends over. The food's all set to go. You've been slaving all day. Everything looks perfect. You've made one of those popular charcuterie boards, you know, a cheese board with fruit, and nuts, and vegetables, maybe some Italian cold cuts. You put a lot of effort into it, and it shows. And as you see the first of your guests pulling into the driveway, distracted, you drop the board and all of the food, the cheese, the crackers, fruit and vegetables, everything, all slide onto your kitchen floor. Well, first, let's let the record reflect that, of course, your floor is clean, especially since you're having guests over. But the question I have for you is this. Do you quickly pick up the food you've dropped, wipe or rinse off what you can, and put as much back on the tray as possible, as soon as possible? Or do you toss it all and open up a box of Triscuits and pour some M&Ms in a bowl? And that brings us to something most of us know as the five second rule. That is, if food only briefly, five seconds or less, falls on the floor, is it safe to eat? Ethics aside, that is, do you tell your guests the food hit the floor before they arrived? Is it bad to eat that food? Or is there some truth to the five second rule that the likelihood of contamination is so slim that it's actually all right to eat the food? In one published study, this one carried out by microbiologists at Rutgers University, it clearly disproved the notion that it's ever really all right to scoop up food and eat it within any safe five second window. They found that moisture, the type of surface, and the contact time for the fallen food all contribute to some level of cross-contamination and that in some instances the transfer and contamination begin in less than a second. In their tests, not surprisingly, the researchers found that the wetter the food, the more contamination there was. Also not surprisingly, longer food contact resulted in the transfer of more bacteria from each surface to the food. The longer the food contact time, the more the transfer of bacteria. What was surprising was the finding that carpet had a much lower transfer rate compared to, say, tile or stainless steel or even hardwood floors. And in a less scientific study from 2003 at the University of Illinois, that study's authors found that women are not only more likely to be familiar with the five second rule than our men, but they're also more likely to eat food that's fallen onto the floor. Sorry, ladies, that's a bit of a dubious honor. And to compound that honor, those same Illinois researchers found that cookies and candy were more likely to be picked up and eaten than were cauliflower or broccoli which begs the question, if someone really wants that food that fell, will they come up with some reason why it's all right to eat it regardless of the time or the circumstances? The conclusion? Ultimately, it seems that the five second rule is little more than an urban myth because there are bacteria pretty much everywhere around us that can contaminate our food almost instantaneously it seems in the final analysis that following that five second rule falls into the category of being pretty bad. It looks like from an ethical and sanitary perspective, your guests will be getting those Triscuits and M&Ms. And while we're on the subject of food, you have a taste for a peanut butter sandwich. So you take the jar out of the cabinet, you grab a plate, you reach into the bag of bread only to find that it may be a little bit older than you thought. The telltale sign, there's some fuzzy mold on a few of the pieces. So the question I have for you is, are you someone who thinks there's really no reason to waste an otherwise perfectly good loaf of bread and simply cut off those offending pieces? After all, it's like penicillin or blue cheese, you know. How bad can it be? 
It seems that specialists for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the USDA as we know it, strongly advise you that you shouldn't just cut off the mold and eat the remaining items, especially if it's a soft food like bread. With soft foods, it's easy for the roots of mold to penetrate deeper into the food than you can see at first glance. The fact of the matter is that there's undoubtedly a network of microscopic roots beneath what's visible to the naked eye. And not only can a mold's penetration into a piece of bread be greater than a quick look suggests, by the time mold has moved in, other harmful kinds of bacteria associated with food spoiling may also have infiltrated the food. Soft foods, lunch meats, jams, they should be tossed once moldy, according to the USDA. But hard cheeses, salamis, and vegetables like carrots, peppers, cabbage, they have tougher surfaces, making it more difficult for a mold's roots to move through. So with those kinds of foods, you can easily cut off the mold at the surface before it ruins the food's interior. And if you accidentally eat moldy food, well, first off, don't panic and don't worry. Don't run to the bathroom, scrub your tongue with a bar of soap. You're not going to die from eating mold. In fact, as long as your immune system is in good shape, you can digest it like any other food. Although some molds can be dangerous, those that are routinely found on your everyday food after a brief period of time usually aren't, according to the USDA. One last caveat. Toasting that piece of colorful bread so that you can still eat your peanut butter? Not a good idea. It won't kill the mold on it. So the conclusion? Eating moldy food probably won't make you sick, but most food should be thrown away at the first sign of fuzz. How bad is it? Well, anywhere from not so bad to bad, so you may want to avoid it. And there you are, chewing a piece of gum when, oops, you accidentally swallow it. Is that gum going to sit in your gut for seven or ten years and wreak havoc with your system? How bad is it to swallow a piece of gum? To begin with, that piece of chewing gum is probably made up of the gum itself, that's the gum base, as well as some kinds of preservatives, flavorings, sweeteners. Although people can't digest the gum base, they can digest the things that have been added to chewing gum, like those sweeteners. Even medicines like the nicotine in nicotine gum can be used, uh, can be absorbed. The body absorbs those ingredients through the act of chewing it itself. The rest of it, the gum base, well, out it goes. I'd be remiss if I didn't say that in rare cases, swallowing large amounts of gum or many smaller pieces over a very short period of time can potentially block the digestive tract, but we're talking about large amounts. So the conclusion is, swallowing a piece of gum on occasion is really not so bad. Here's one for you. Bad, not so bad, pretty bad. Whether it's from anxiety, restlessness, or maybe it's enjoying the sound and feeling, there are a lot of reasons why people crack their knuckles. But is it bad to do it? The short answer is that although cracking your knuckles may aggravate some of the people around you, most studies have found that it's really not bad for you. And contrary to what a lot of people may think, it probably won't increase your risk for developing arthritis or any other ailments. So what exactly is that popping sound when someone cracks their knuckles? It's the sound of bubbles bursting in what's called the synovial fluid that helps lubricate the joints in your fingers. The bubbles pop when you pull the bones apart, the joints, either by stretching the fingers or bending them backward, creating negative pressure. And even if cracking your knuckles won't cause arthritis, there are still good reasons to let go of the habit. There are some published reports of injuries suffered while people were trying to crack their knuckles with great force, and it's also possible to dislocate the joints in your fingers. But again, that's apparently if enough external pressure is applied and it's very uncommon. Chronic knuckle cracking can potentially lead to reduced grip and it can cause temporary swelling in your fingers, even a feeling of weakness in your hands. At the end of the day, the conclusion is occasionally cracking your knuckles, it's not so bad for you. Picture this, it's a scorching hot summer day. 
You just finished a perfect picnic lunch on the beach. You're comfortably full. You can't wait to jump into the water and cool off. And then a voice in your head warns you, wait at least 30 minutes or an hour before you go swimming, or you'll get a cramp. And who knows what terrible fate will befall you if you don't wait. As kids, few of us wanted to tempt fate. And besides, most of our parents wouldn't let us anyways. So we impatiently waited that 30 minutes or an hour. The theory, if there was one, was that the process of digestion increased blood flow to the stomach and away from the muscles you needed to swim, your arms, your legs. The result, it was thought, would be terrible cramps in the muscles of your arms and legs, which in turn increased the risk of drowning. Abundant medical research tells us that while swimming strenuously on a full stomach could conceivably lead to cramps, think competitively swimming or trying to cross the English Channel, for most of us recreational swimmers, the chances of suffering debilitating cramps, very slim. Although your body does supply extra blood to aid in digestion, it's nowhere near enough to keep your arm and leg muscles from properly functioning. At least one published study that examined drownings in the United States found that fewer than 1% occurred after the person had eaten a meal. On the other hand, studies have consistently found a correlation between drinking alcohol and swimming. For example, in one study among adult drownings in California, researchers found that more than 40% of the deaths were alcohol related. The conclusion is it's not so bad to go for a swim immediately after you've eaten, unless you plan on swimming across the English Channel or if you've had a few too many. From summer to winter, picture this. You just took a nice hot shower, thinking you have plenty of time before your ride arrives. But then your ride comes early. So you quickly get dressed, dash out the door. It's the middle of winter. It's freezing cold out. Are you more likely to catch a cold? And is it bad for you to go outside in the freezing cold with wet hair? By the way, it's said we've been calling it a cold as far back as the 16th century. Because when we're cold, we get the shivers our noses begin to run, our eyes may water, just as when we're sick with the virus that causes the common cold. It's called the rhinovirus, to be specific. But is there any connection between feeling cold and getting a cold? And are you really more likely to get a cold when you go outside with wet hair? The short answer is that colds are caused by viruses, not by cold weather or by having wet hair. You catch a cold when you breathe in airborne droplets that are coughed or sneezed into the air by someone who's sick. Colds can be spread when a sick person touches you or a surface like a doorknob or a keyboard that you then touch. And then you in turn touch your eyes, your nose, your mouth. Interesting though, in what some researchers are calling a scientific breakthrough just recently Scientists at Stanford University may have come across a biological reason why we get more respiratory illnesses, like colds, in the wintertime. They suggest that cold air itself can damage the immune response occurring in our noses. They found that reducing the temperature inside the nose by as little as 9 degrees Fahrenheit actually kills nearly 50% of the billions of good virus and bacteria fighting cells in our nostrils. They found that cold air is associated with increased viral infection because we essentially lose half of our immunity just by a small drop in temperature. It's also been said that we tend to have more colds during the winter months because we spend more time indoors and in closer quarters with one another. So it's more likely that we'll cross paths with a cold causing virus spread from someone else in the room. The conclusion? It's not so bad to go outside on a cold winter day with wet hair, unless you consider that you may not look your best when your hair freezes, in which case it could be really bad. And by the way, if you're interested, there's actually a hair freezing contest held annually at a result in the Canadian Yukon Territory. The winner in each of five categories gets $2,000 along with a host of other prizes. The crucial part of the contest is apparently having just the right weather conditions, 
Frosty temperatures below minus 4 Fahrenheit are essential, but thanks to the temperatures of the hot springs, 104 degrees, contestants are said to stay safe and warm. Speaking of colds, how bad is it to hold in a sneeze? There was a time when sneezing in certain public situations, like in a movie theater or during someone's speech, might have been considered simply bad manners. Now, though, even the tiniest sneeze or cough can make people turn their heads or politely try to distance themselves from you. So when you have the urge to sneeze, should you just hold it in? And is that bad for you? And if it is, how bad? Sneezing is the body's way of clearing irritants like germs, pollen, or dust from our noses and throats. A sneeze can be powerful, expelling tens of thousands of droplets from your nose at a rate of up to 100 miles an hour, according to the American Lung Association. Some people have a less powerful sneeze reflex, and that, it seems, may lead to a number of sneezes in a row. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Then there are those who try valiantly to either avoid sneezing or completely stifle their sneezes. The question is whether it's bad to hold in that sneeze. It seems that doing so comes with some potential negative side effects. Some of them could be serious. According to a published study in the American Journal of Rhinology and Allergy, closing off your airways during a sneeze can place up to 20 times more pressure on your airways compared to simply letting out the sneeze. And although that alone may not be dangerous, you'd be putting pressure on your diaphragm, the muscle in your chest, and there's the possibility that you could actually cause damage to your eardrums by holding in a sneeze. Our nose and our ears are connected by tubes, and if you hold in a sneeze, that increased pressure in your nose and in turn your ears could potentially damage your eardrums. The conclusion? It's typically not that bad to suppress your sneezes, but it could be pretty bad. You should let your sneezes out whenever possible. And as we've come to learn from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, it's recommended that in order to keep your sneeze from turning into a super spreader event, you should sneeze into your elbow or cover your mouth and nose with a tissue. So, we've learned about wet hair on a freezing cold day, but what about having a bit of alcohol to warm you up on that cold winter day? How bad is it? Since the early 18th century, monks living in the snowy, dangerous St. Bernard Pass, a route through the Alps between Italy and Switzerland, kept dogs to help them on their rescue missions after bad snowstorms. It's said that over the course of about 200 years, thousands of people from lost children to Napoleon soldiers were rescued because of the heroic dog's uncanny sense of direction and resistance to cold. Since then, and through much crossbreeding, those dogs have become the domestic St. Bernards that we're familiar with today. And often those dogs would find buried treasure, uh, treasures and travelers, dig through the snow, lie on top of the injured, and provide warmth. And in legend and in paintings, depictions over the years, can you picture those St. Bernards with casks around their necks? Casks of liquor, thought to be brandy or whiskey, strapped to their collars to help warm travelers. Although the use of whiskey as medicine wasn't a new concept, and it could very well have been a part of a rescue operation, there really aren't any historical records to conclusively document the practice. So that brings us to the question of whether it's actually a good thing to drink alcohol to warm up on a freezing day. The truth is that drinking alcohol actually makes your body temperature colder because alcohol is a vasodilator. It causes your blood vessels to dilate. That dilation is the warm feeling you first experience. But when your blood vessels are dilated, it's harder for your body to constrict them. And constricting blood vessels would minimize the blood flow near your skin, keeping the core of your body warm. And alcohol impairs your body's ability to shiver, which is one of the most important ways your body keeps itself warm. If you do start feeling warm after that nip or two, well, just know that if your body starts sweating a bit, that will only bring down your body temperature further. It also goes without saying, but I'll say it anyways, 
Alcohol has a tendency to impair judgment. People feel warmer, so they don't keep their gloves or hat or coats on, leading to hypothermia. So the short answer, as you probably can guess, is that it's actually a really bad thing to drink alcohol while outside on a cold winter's day. So picture this. There you are, sadly lost at sea for days on end with the hot sun beating down on you, nothing left to drink. How bad is it if you start drinking from that vast sea of water you're floating on when there's nothing left to drink? And we're not talking about the occasional gulp of salt water when you're frolicking in the ocean or at the beach. The National Ocean Service, a part of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, says this, drinking seawater can be deadly to humans. As we all know, seawater contains salt. While we can safely ingest small amounts of salt, the small salt content in seawater is much higher than what can be processed by the human body. When we consume salt as part of our daily diets, for example, we also drink plenty of liquids, and that helps to dilute the salt and keep it at a healthy level. The net result of drinking too much seawater is that you suffer from dehydration. And so the conclusion, it's really bad to drink more than an occasional mouthful of salt water. It seems that if you're lost at sea and keep drinking salt water, you'll keep adding to the amount of salt you need to get out of your body. Not a good thing. And what if all that was left on your life raft were bags of black licorice, real black licorice, made from licorice root extract? How bad would it be if that's all you ate for days and weeks on end? Most of us are familiar with Twizzlers candy. Actually, Twizzlers twists, to be exact first produced in the late 1920s by one of our country's oldest confectionery firms, the company was acquired by the Hershey Company in 1977. Those original Twizzlers, the flavor was licorice and only licorice. In the mid-1970s, the company began to expand its flavors to include grape, cherry, strawberry. And today, strawberry is far and away the favorite Twizzlers flavor. Although most people refer sort of generically to twi Twizzlers as licorice, the truth is most Twizzlers contain absolutely no real licorice. And those that do have only a tiny percentage of licorice root extract. It seems, though, that there have been several similar case reports in medical journals to the one I'm about to tell you which, about, in which patients experienced a host of heart-related problems traced directly to black licorice. In fact, in 2020, it was reported that black licorice was the culprit in the death of a 54-year-old man in Massachusetts. How is that possible? Overdosing on black licorice? According to some medical experts, as well as the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, the problem is that some licorice candy contains an ingredient called glycerazin, a sweetening compound derived from the licorice root. When eaten in excessive quantities, like that poor fellow who ate a bag and a half in the course of three weeks, a bag and a half a day in the course of three weeks, who also had some pre-existing heart problems, eating that much of that enzyme and that chemical apparently caused heart-related complications. So what does Hershey's, the maker of Twizzlers, say about all of this? According to the company's spokesperson, and I quote, as with any treat or candy, we recommend you eat licorice in moderation and as part of an overall balanced diet. Hershey's added that a majority of its Twizzler sales do not come from black licorice, but rather its red licorice line, including strawberry and cherry flavored products. And those don't contain any amount of that chemical ingredient, glycerazin. Although it does sell a very small amount of traditional Twizzlers black licorice made with real licorice root extract, the amount of that extract and the natural chemical are minuscule, well below the US FDA's limitation. The conclusion, enjoy your occasional piece of black licorice. And as with everything else in life, to do so in moderation, not so bad. I'm Jay Elias. Thank you for watching this episode of Live and Learn. 
I hope you enjoyed it. I look forward to your joining me again for another program designed to enhance and encourage your personal wellness and awareness. Until then, remember, it's never too late to learn. And in closing, consider this. Although it's been stated many different ways, Brazilian author Paulo Coelho said it quite succinctly. When you repeat a mistake, it's not a mistake anymore. It's a decision.